So with some of the lessons, Dave mentioned some of these, but uh, I've been involved in a, in a lot of brands, and I'm going to talk about some of them, not, not all of these, but I'll, I'll go through a, f a few of them just to kind of give you a flavor of, uh, of what I've been doing in my, in, in my life and what I learned, more importantly. So I started, as Dave said, in the advertising business in J. Walter Thompson in New York City in the late 60s, and I was very fortunate. I worked in a group that mainly was involved in creating new products for existing customers. And one of our customers, one of our clients, should I say, was Miles Laboratories out of Elkhart, Indiana, the guys who make Alka-Seltzer and one-a-day vitamins. And back in those days, they made a vitamin called Chalks, which was a square chocolate-flavored pill. And a competitor, Bristol Myers, one day brought out animal, multicolored, multi-flavored, fruit-flavored vitamins called PALS. And the chalks business, literally, you've never seen anything like this. It literally disappeared. It, in one week, it fell off the mark, the map. It just stopped selling. So Miles said to us, well, what do we do? What can we do? And we did a whole bunch of research, and we said, well, you, you, there's this character, Fred Flintstone and his group of characters, and, and uh, they tested better than anything else. Uh, actually, Snoopy tested better, but Snoopy was already taken by interstate baking for nutritional products. So we, we said, you got to do Flintstones vitamins. They said, you're out of your mind. You don't know what you're talking about. All our media experts say it's over for Flintstones. It just went from prime time to Saturday morning. It's the kiss of death. Uh, it's done. What are you, you guys are nuts. Go back and do some more work. So we did, and the results of the research came out the same. Kids liked Fred Flintstone and, and his cast of characters for a vitamin tablet. So we went back out to Miles and Elkhart, and, and they said, well, okay, if you guys don't have any better idea, you come out here and manage this because we don't have anybody here that wants to work on this. And so we went out to Elkhart, and we literally in six months got the, the formulation done and the packaging and advertising. We were the first to do what then was called rotoscope advertising, where we actually had live children included with animation, climbing mountains with Fred Flintstone and things like that. And uh, we brought the product out. And in, in uh, six weeks, it was the number one selling vitamin in the United States. And that was, by the way, in 1968. It's still the number one selling vitamin in the, in the, in the United States today. So it was, it was quite an interesting, where all the media experts were against us, the marketing consultants were against us, the president of, of uh, Labor Miles Laboratories was against us, but it turned out to be the right, the right uh, decision. And strangely enough, that introduced me to Mattel because there was a Senate subcommittee hearing on children's advertising, and they, uh, they were critical of advertising to children, cereals, sweetened cereals, sugar, toys, no video games back in those days. So in 1970 or 71, I can't remember exactly, I had to appear before a Senate subcommittee hearing in, in Washington, D.C., and those are really fun because they sit you down at a Formica table with a hard steel chair, and the senators sit up above higher with nice mahogany desk and look down at you and point at you. And so Senator Margaret Chase Smith from Maine pointed at me and said, So, Mr. Kalinske, you think selling drugs to children is a good idea? And I said, well, Senator, I'm sure you know that 43% of America's children aren't getting proper nutrition from their meals, and it's not their mom's fault. Their moms really are trying, but the kids just won't eat vegetables and fruits the way they should. So by taking a multi-flavored vitamin that has minerals and vitamins in it, they're getting all the nutrition they need that they're not getting from the food, which they aren't eating. And by the way, here's a letter from a mom. Let me read it to you, Senator. And I read a letter that basically from a mom that said that, thank you, I finally feel comfortable that my child is getting proper nutrition. And then I pulled out a mailbag and I said, I have a thousand more letters. Could I read some more of them to you? And Senator Margaret Chase Smith said, that'll be enough, Mr. Kalinske. And the guys from Mattel were behind me. They were speaking next or getting quizzed next. And they just started laughing. They thought this was pretty good. Anyway, that was what introduced me to Mattel. So I started at Mattel in early 1972. And I worked on preschool toys, jack-in-the-boxes, CNCs, putt-putt railroads. And after a year or so, the president of Mattel came into my cubicle, which was right outside the men's and ladies' room, so it was very convenient for conversations. And she's, her name was Ruth Handler. And Ruth Handler came in and said, Tom, Barbie sales declined last year. It's the first time this has ever happened. And my retail buyers say it's over for Barbie. The Wall Street analysts say it's over for Barbie. My own sales force says it's over for Barbie. My CFO says we got to go on to something else and we shouldn't be investing in Barbie anymore. Sales are down to $42 million. What do you think we should do? And I said, Ruth, that's the stupidest thing I have ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. She said, that's what I wanted to hear. You're now the marketing director and product development director for Barbie. 
So, I started working, in those days, believe it or not, the company would bring out one doll, one line of costumes, and one accessory for Barbie each year. And I thought that was sort of crazy. So, I, I, I asked Ruth, I said, what, what is it about Barbie that makes her so special? And Ruth said to me, with Barbie, a girl can be anything she wants to be. I said, God, that's great, that's a great line. We're gonna use that in our packaging and all of our advertising. And we started to use that, that, that phrase, and uh, there was a famous song we did to the words of Georgie Girl that uh, communicated that. And I then decided we're going to do a lot more than one doll. We're going to segment the market. We're going to do a doll for little girls that are two- and three-year-olds and can't deal with buttons and zippers, and we'll call it My First Barbie. We're going to do a really cheap doll with just a bathing suit on and call it Malibu Barbie because then they'll have to buy more costumes and accessories for it. And we're going to do really expensive dolls for the collector market, for the older girl market and the adult market. And we're going to do a deal with Oscar de la Renna, the famous designer. And we're going to charge $100 for these dolls. And by the way, we're going to do occupation dolls. And in those days, I think the, one of the first ones we did was Astronaut Barbie. I did do President Barbie. I think it was 1976 when we did President Barbie. I think they've redone it since. Last year, they did uh, uh, Entrepreneur Barbie and Veterinarian Barbie. And uh, I noticed that uh, you probably saw in the newspaper just a few days ago, they're, they're doing, uh, I forgot the name now, but it's code, Coding Barbie or Programming Barbie and teaching coding language through the packaging and some stuff on the, on the doll, which I thought was pretty cool. And then the other thing I did was huge, a huge house that was uh, in those days about $60, and it was empty, so you had to buy furniture for it. That's sort of like hardware. You have to buy hardware, then you put software on it to play with. Well, that was, I learned that there. So today, the average retailer has 48 feet of Barbie pink. Uh, we grew the brand dramatically. We grew it to, while I was working on it, from 42 million to 550 million. Uh, I then became president and later CEO of Mattel, and the people that succeeded me built it to about a billion dollars. At one point, it was up to $2 billion. Uh, recent years, as you've probably read in the newspapers, it's fallen back, and they're back down at about 1.1 billion. There's over 100 million dolls sold each year. It's about two a second, and the average girl owns 10 Barbies. So it, it was quite a great experience f for me. And while I was um, uh, actually president, the chairman of the company said, gee, you know, we don't have a male action line, and uh, we, we need one. Some of you might remember Masters of the Universe, He-Man. I have the power! You remember that? And uh, so that came out of research. That was a pure product designed by research and very unusual. Uh, we researched every theme that you could imagine that boys might be interested in, including licensed characters, including occupations like policemen and firemen and what have you, space characters. Hasbro had Star Wars and, and G.I. Joe, and we basically had uh, Big Jim. You probably don't remember Big Jim. Big Jim wasn't so big. and. Uh, um, so anyway, He-Man won this research, this, this guy who, who looks very muscular and heroic, and he had this adversary, Skeletor, who obviously is very evil, and they competed with each other in Castle Grayskull, so they had a nice location to duel it out. And we built it to about a $75 million business. But the chairman of Mattel came in my office one day and said, well, that's nice, you got a $75 million business now, but gee, you'll never be very important because you can't get a movie or a television show the way Hasbro has. And I said, you want to bet? So I did a deal with a group called Filmation and with then Group W TV stations. Group, group W had TV stations all over the United States. And we, we invested $3.5 million. Group W invested $3.5 million. And we produced 65 half hours on He-Man and Masters of the Universe. And you may remember those animated shows. They were, they were on five days a week after school. Uh, we basically gave the show away free to the local stations, and what did they want it for? Well, they could then sell advertising around that show. In return, they gave us three of the advertising spots. I believe there were six per 30-minute 30, per 30 uh, sp slot. So we used the three that we had, either for advertising. By law, we couldn't advertise He-Man within the He-Man show, so we'd advertise you know, Hot Wheels or other products that we had within the, within the show. And sometimes we sold the spots out, and we ended up selling them to McDonald's and to Kellogg's and what have you. Well, the show became such a huge hit, and this was completely unanticipated, we made a profit 
off of the television show by selling the, the spots that we had. And this, this became uh, a model that back in those, it was the first time this was done, the idea of giving some, giving, spending seven and a half million dollars and then giving it away free to the local stations and getting your money back through advertising. But it really worked, we got huge ratings, and the sales of course took off on He-Man and Masters of the Universe, and it became a 75, a 750 million dollar brand, so it grew 10 times within a year and a half uh, and became quite important to the company. Plus, we had licensing revenue and comic books on it, and then some of you may remember the uh, infamous movie that we did uh, with Oscar, uh, with um, uh, Dolph Lundgren. Mm -hmm. uh, not such a great movie, but it didn't hurt the sales. So lessons? Yeah, research can produce great products. Not all the time, but, but a lot of the time. And persistence certainly overcomes negativity. And boy, does 30 minutes of TV five days a week help uh, promote, a, promote a product. And this became the brand development model that everybody started using. We used it at, at Mattel. We did uh, She-Ra, Princess of Power television show. We did Rainbow Bright television show. We did Captain Power. We did a whole bunch of them. And Hasbro, of course, picked it up. And they've done it on almost all of their, their key lines. All right. So... I, in between Mattel and Sega, I had actually bought uh, Matchbox toys out of receivership with a friend of mine in China. And we, it was in re receivership means it was bankrupt, basically. And, and we ended up, it was in England, we ended up turning the company around. We had to move all the manufacturing out of England to, to China. And we turned it into a profitable company and we took it public. Uh, but it was an exhausting three-year experience. I literally traveled over 200 days a year for three years doing that. So when we got an offer from someone to buy the company, we were very happy to, to sell it. And I was on a, a beach in uh, Hawaii with my family on vacation. And I had known Sega a little bit. They'd asked me to help distribute their products in Europe through, through Matchbox sales organization when I was running Matchbox. I had known the chairman, the guy who became chairman, Hayao Nakayama, when he was a marketing guy for Sega. Uh, in, and it was working when Sega was owned by Paramount Pictures and reported to Barry Diller and Mike Eisner. And, uh, and so uh, I, I was familiar with them. But anyway, I'm lying on this beach in Hawaii and Hayao Nakayama shows up and says, I've been looking for you. I said, well, how'd you find me? And he found me through my secretary back in, uh, in LA. And he said, I, well, you've got to come to Tokyo with me. And I said, why would I want to do that? And he said, because I'm going to show you 16-bit technology and I want you to get involved with running Sega of America and taking on Nintendo. I said, well, that sounds really dumb. Uh, Nintendo's 92% of the market, uh, yeah, they have, all these great characters and relationships and distribution. It sounds like an impossible thing. He says, no, it's not. Come to Japan with me. So I went to Japan, and I fell in love with 16-bit technology. Now, you got to imagine, when I was at Mattel, we had Intellivision. Remember Intellivision in the early days against uh, Atari? Well, that was pretty rudimentary, right? And all of a sudden, I'm looking at 16-bit. I'd missed out the 8-bit in between. And I was really impressed by what 16-bit technology brought to video games and the quality of play that one could achieve. So I got hooked, and I decided to take on this, this task, even though, uh, as I said, Nintendo had Mario in 92% of the market, and Sega had Shinobi, which nobody had ever heard of, no third-party support, no retail distribution, a demoralized company that I went into. But there were great people there. And uh, I worked with the team. And after about uh, six months, I went back to Japan and I said, okay, here's what we got to do to really take on Nintendo. We're going to lower the price of our hardware with software in it. We're going to take the software that you have been selling in it, Altered Beast, out. Because in Kansas and Oklahoma, they think that's uh, devil worship. And we're going to put our best title in, which was under development, which is a no whole other story, which was Son became Sonic the Hedgehog. And we're going to really fight Mario with Sonic. Uh, and we're going to change the market. We're going to leave the little kids. We're going to leave the 5 to 12-year-olds to Nintendo. We're not even going to try to go after them. We're going after teenagers and college-age uh, students. And we're going to attack Nintendo in advertising. We're going to make fun of them. Uh, we're going to position them as the little kid's toy. 
that no one really wants because they want the big boy toy, which is going to be us. And we're going to do a lot of sports titles in the United States. And we're going to have to build up a team in the United States. And we're going to do more sports and more American licenses and more American developed products. So you've got to invest. You've got to give me money to do all this. And the board started discussing all this. And, and my interpreter was in my ear saying, well, they all think you're crazy. No one agrees with anything you want to do. Uh, they think you're going to drive the company into bankruptcy. Uh, we don't want to, they don't want to do it. And Nakayama got up and as he was leaving the room, he turned and he said to me, okay, no one agrees with anything you want to do. I don't agree with anything you want to do. But when I hired you, I made a commitment that you could make the decisions for the Western world market. So go ahead and do these things. So we did. And we, of course, developed Sonic, and then Sonic Tuesday became the launch day of all video games. Tuesday never was before. It always was a Friday before that. Uh, we did very aggressive advertising on, initially it was, it was uh, Sega does what Nintendo don't, and then it was welcome to the next level, and it was a large scream from Sega. And uh, here's one of those commercials. So that was just one of many very aggressive commercials against Nintendo, and it seemed to work uh, very, very well for us. There were a lot of firsts that we did at Sega that some of you may not be aware of. Um, and by the way, by, by 1994, we had passed Nintendo in share of market. We had a 55% share of market. Um, we also had tremendous retail support and third-party support and had done the, all of the leading uh, sports games in, along with electronic arts in the, in the country and in, in Europe as well. Uh, in 1994, eight of the ten best-selling video games were from Sega. I used to say to Larry Probst, oh, and at EA, Larry Probst uh, was running it, and um, he took over from Trip Hawkins, and 90% uh, of their profit in 1994, 90% was from Sega titles. Now, of course, they weren't supporting Nintendo in those days, and there was no, no Sony yet. So anyway, we did a lot of firsts. We were the first to do shopping mall tours and compare our products against Nintendo's. We were the first to, to get a kid on every college campus who was a real devout game player and give him a Genesis and send him a free software title every month, and just all he had to do was talk it up on the college campuses. Well, we were the first to really have women in senior management positions in the company, and we had a lot of them. And it really, I really believe in diversity in, in a company, uh, and I, I think some of the ideas that uh, the staff we had from our female executives were fantastic. We, as I mentioned, we were the first to introduce a street date for a product. We were, we were the first to sponsor rock concerts, uh, and we also were, were the first to to do a, a Sega Foundation where we supported children's health causes. We were the first to support Pediatric AIDS Foundation back in a day when you couldn't even say AIDS without being afraid your company was going to be destroyed. We were the first to support game rentals. My opinion was if, you, if we allowed people to rent a game, it was great marketing because if it was really a good game, they weren't going to be able to finish it in a day or two. They were going to want to come back and play it some more. And if it was a lousy game, nobody would rent it and we'd find out. So it was a good way to, to cull bad products out of, the, out of the market. We were the first to do, uh, on a, 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 it was a cable system, it's kind of the first leading up to doing online games, the Sega Channel. We had 250,000 subscribers. So anyway, and, and we of course started the game rating system, which later was adopted by the, the uh, ESRB. It really was the system that we had developed at Sega with Dr. Arthur Prober and five other professors of sociology and children's education and psychology. Psychology. It became the rating system that is still used today on on all games. They changed a little bit of the terms from you know the, we we had G and G A and T for teen and M A. Uh, uh, they've changed those a little bit, but but not much. So a lot of a lot of firsts came out of out of Sega for the uh, video game business. Our business grew to a billion and a half dollars in the U.S. and about a billion in in uh, in in Europe. 
And I think the lessons are still important for the market today because we, cha we really did change the market from being a young kid's business to an every age business. When I left the company, our average age was 21 years of age. Sony today tells me their average age is 32, I believe, average age of a player. Uh, pricing hardware low and software high made a lot of sense back in those days. Be aggressive and go after the competition really worked for us. It doesn't always work, but it worked for us. We became the, the cool brand, and Sonic, of course, became a mega franchise and still is a pretty big franchise today. And we were very creative and did a lot of guerrilla marketing. One quick story on the guerrilla marketing. So Walmart in 1992 wouldn't carry us. Where they were afraid of Nintendo. Nintendo was so powerful, they were afraid that if they carried Nintendo's uh, systems, they wouldn't get their allocation of hardware or Nintendo software titles, and that they would be left in the cold, and Target and Best Buy and Toys R Us would have all of those products. And so they refused to carry us. Well, that really hurt my feelings deeply because I was very friendly with Sam Walton. I used to fly around the country on his plane with him piloting it. I knew every executive down in Bentonville, and yet I couldn't get Sega products into Walmart. So I turned Bentonville into Segaville. Around the corner, if you've ever been to Bentonville, you probably haven't, but it's in the middle of Arkansas, uh, southwest Arkansas, and yeah, northwest Arkansas. And on high, off Highway 49 is their headquarters, and right around the corner, there was a strip mall, and there was an empty store there. So that empty store I rented, and I put a huge sign up that said, uh, come play Sega for free. And I put as many TVs and Genesis systems in there as I could. And within a few hours, I had a line of teenagers out, out the door. And so, of course, the Walmart executives are driving by that every day. And then I bought every billboard in and out of Sega along the highways that I could with Sega does what Nintendo don't. And... Uh, uh, welcome to the next level. And I bought all the radio and TV advertising I could and just flooded the Bentonville market. And then down the road, there's the University of Arkansas, and I bought the seat cushions and put a big Sega on the back of each seat cushion. So, you know, when they hold, they hold up seat cushions in, that, in those days to make different signs, there were different colors of them, and they'd project different words. But every time they turn them around, you'd see Sega all over the football stadium. Uh, and I would call the vice president of merchandising every week, and I'd say, Rick, this week at Toys R Us, we're outselling Nintendo by 30%. Oh, and at Target, we're outselling them by 25%. Thought you'd want to know. <laughs> and pretty soon, Rick called me back, and he said, okay, just stop it. I give up. My board is asking, why is this going on? Why don't we have Sega products? We'll give you four feet. And so that's how we got four, <laughs> four feet in, into Walmart. But I think it's an example of the kind of aggressive uh, guerrilla marketing that that we did. All right, long story short, uh, everything was going great until I wanted to do a deal with Sony. We were working together on the first CD, optical disc uh, system of games, and uh, I really got close with the Sony guys, with Olaf Olison and, and Mickey Shuloff, and we decided that the, the wise thing to do would be to do a joint hardware system, a Sega Sony hardware system. Because after all, we all lost money on hardware, so why not just do one new system, have it be Sega Sony, and then each of us will benefit from the software we produce. Well, to me, this was a no-brainer. We were much better in those days at developing software than Sony was. And Mickey wanted to do it, Olaf wanted to do it. We went to Japan and we met with, uh, in those days, IDA and at Sony, and, and he agreed that was a smart thing to do. Went over to Sega, and Nakayama said, no, not going to do that. Those guys don't know anything about making video games. Why would you want to do a deal with Sony? So we didn't do a deal with Sony. Uh, this was the start of when my ability to make decisions that I wanted was vanishing, basically. Uh, the Saturn system was a system that my head of R&D, uh, Joe Miller, and I weren't, weren't really crazy about. We wanted to keep Genesis going longer. Um, so we did a lot of things to try to do that, but basically I got ordered to introduce Saturn six months before it ever should have been introduced. Didn't have enough software available for it. Didn't have, a, didn't even have enough hardware to supply, uh, distribution, retail distribution in those days. And, uh, anyway, so the, it, it had come time for, for me to start thinking about other things to do. Fortunately, I got contacted by, uh, Larry Ellison and Mike Milken 
and they wanted to invest in using video game technology and Silicon Valley technology to improve education. Now at Sega, I had, I had been involved in introducing the Pico, which was an educational product for young children, and it was quite—it was actually quite quite successful. It was a very—we positioned it as a child's first computer, um, and so I was really intrigued by this idea of using video game technology to improve education. So I became president uh, and CEO of Knowledge Universe. And I had $500 million, 250 from Mike, 250 from Larry, to invest in starting from ground zero ed tech companies or buying them. And we did about half and half. So we, uh, we started 18 companies. Uh, you might have heard of K-12. It trades under the symbol Learn. It has about a billion dollar market cap today, started by a guy named Ron Packard, whose idea was let's, uh, let's put together the best curriculum for homeschoolers. A few years later, he came into my office and he said, you know, that worked pretty well. Now let's do the best curriculum for charter schools and really supported the charter school movement. We started Teacher Universe, which was a teacher training company to help teachers learn how to use technology. We started Knowledge Beginnings, which was a chain of preschools with uh, our idea was to be, kind of be the Walmart of preschools. High quality, low cost, new technology in it. That uh, became a chain of 3,500 preschools across the basically the world. Uh, we started KU Kids, we started Yaya Games, we bought 18 companies, we bought an IT company, a training company called, uh, became called Spring in, in England, which uh, we grew from 100 million to 700 million in revenue. We started Productivity Point International here in the United States for teaching IT skills to people. And we, and we bought LeapFrog when it was doing about 3 million in revenue, and I was so entranced with LeapFrog and kids' educa early education that I went in as CEO. While I may remain president of Knowledge Universe, I was also CEO of, of LeapFrog. And we grew that from $3 million to about, we took it public at $350 million in 2002, grew it to about $650 million. And by 2005, our, all of these companies had revenues well over $2 billion. And in those years, Mike and Larry decided it was time to, to stop being in business together. And we divided the assets back to them. And uh, uh, that, that, that took quite a while, by the way. But we got it done. I continued to work in, in using technology to improve education. I stayed on the board of some of these companies. I went on the board of Blackboard. You might have heard of Blackboard. Uh, for, I was on that board for years. I went on the board of something called Cambium Learning Group. So lately, that's mostly what I've, what I've done. Uh, and by the way, again, on the point of experts are always wrong, experts said education doesn't sell. They told Larry and Mike and I, don't do this. Don't spend this money on ed tech companies. It's, it, we won't get a payback. Well, I think we did because we solved some really serious problems. You know about these problems. A lot of kids uh, aren't ready for school. They aren't ready for kindergarten. And they're not ready for high school. And then only 70% will graduate high school. LeapFrog solved a lot of the early products because we work. We had great curriculum, largely created by Stanford University, by the way. A lot of people don't know that. But the, the dean of the Graduate School of Education really designed the curriculum that was in most of the early LeapFrog products. And we'd made sure they were fun, though. If they weren't fun, kids wouldn't stay with them. So we used the magic of, of video game technology and interactivity to make them fun and interesting. We had our own scope and sequence, basically from, from Stanford. And it really was good, good, good stuff. We sold over 60 million platforms. Uh, and we learned a lot. Again, on the, the lessons that I have learned in, in this long career path, don't believe the experts solve a real problem surround yourself with a great team. I, I mean, everybody says, oh, you did all these wonderful things. I didn't do anything. All I did was hire the right people. You know, and, and just, I, I just had a fabulous team of people, both at Mattel and Sega and, and LeapFrog. And have some advisors who are smarter than you are, who share your vision. Get rid of the naysayers who say, oh, we can't do that. That's impossible. It can't get done. Get rid of them. And have a strategy that others can't copy. I always tell people, if you have a strategy that any other company can pick up and implement as well as you are doing, you don't have a strategy. You've got to be doing something that's different from, uh, from everybody else. I believe in being bold and telling an interesting story. All of my life I've told interesting stories, I mean, through, my, through the brands that I was involved with. And uh, I push the brand development people the, the game developers and the, uh, and the marketing people to tell an interesting story. Write an interesting story before you do anything. And 
celebrate failure. You know, you're going to fail. You're going you're gonna to take some risks that aren't going to work, but make sure they're the right risks to take and have fun while, while you're doing it. So that's basically my, my story of, uh, of my life. I, I, hope, uh, I hope you, uh, you know, can pick up some, some pearls of uh, wisdom from this expert who's probably always wrong. Uh, I won't get into my future predictions, but I will say that I love this in prediction. I predict the Internet will soon go spectacularly supernova and in 1996 will collapse. Robert Metcalf, co-founder of the Ethernet. So a lot of smart people say a lot of, a lot of dumb things, and that's, that's all I have to, to talk about, so thanks for listening. All right, Tom. Uh, so I have a few questions for you, and then I want to open it up to, uh, to the team. Um, are you pulling up Muhammad Ali? I was going to try to get there. Yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, I definitely want you to... I definitely want you to share that story, uh, and we'll get we'll get this pulled up for you while we're while we're doing it. Um, okay, so uh, I guess the, a question, a great background, and you and I've had the the pleasure of knowing each other now for 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 quite some time. Um, there it is. Okay, so uh, we'll why don't you tell that story real quick, and then and then let me and then I'll and then I'll ask you a couple things. Okay. So while I was in advertising in New York City, I spent most of my t time eventually working on Flintstones. But before that, uh, I, I had come out of the military, and, and I guess I had told somebody I, I boxed a lot in the military because I didn't have anything else to do most of the time. So you went in a gym and worked out. And they said, well, we got this. We're doing a commercial for Men in Skin Bracer, and we're doing it with Muhammad Ali. And since you know boxing, you can talk to him. So I was really happy to do this, needless to say. He was the champ. And uh, we go shoot this commercial for Men in Skin Bracer. And you guys might remember some of this. You probably don't remember this. Specific. We did a lot of commercials. But the idea was Men in Skin Bracer, the one attribute it had, it, was a, it would wake you up and make you feel good. And it was, thanks, I needed that, right? The slap, thanks, I needed that. So we had Muhammad Ali do that. And he's, he's fantastic. He was so much fun. And at the end of the shoot, uh, I handed him a check for $25,000. That was his payment for the, for the commercial. And he says, you were supposed to pay me in cash. I said, what? Yeah, I'm leaving for the Bahamas. I need cash. <laughs> so we run to the bank, which was Irving Trust at the corner of 57th and Park in New York City. It was our bank. And I don't know if you remember, back in those days, banks closed at 3 o'clock. It was 3.05. The bank is closed. So I'm there looking in the glass window. I see some execs wandering around there. I'm pointing at Muhammad Ali. And uh, they f finally recognize it's the champ. And they open the gate, uh, the door. I explain the problem. We got a check for 25000 He wants a cashier's check for twenty and 5000 in cash. So we go, they arrange all that. We go to the cashier window. And this vice president is very happily counting out $100 bills to Muhammad Ali. Well, Muhammad, as some of you probably are aware of, was really good at close hand magic. I mean, really good. He could do card tricks and he made things disappear and reappear. So he makes a $100 bill disappear. And he slowly counts the money back to this VP. And of course, he's $100 short. So he grabs this guy by the tie and he says, you trying to cheat me, white boy? Well, this guy, he peed in his pants. He was so scared. I mean, you, you, Muhammad Ali has huge fists, or had huge fists. So, um, and he makes the $100 reappear, and we all have a good laugh, sort of. The teller wasn't too pleased about all this, and, uh, and, and, and we leave. So many years, I stayed in touch with him when I was in different roles, and uh, when I was at uh, Sega, we used him for uh, retailer events, and we used him at um, the, the CES show. And we, and we had him sign autographs for people. And we also had him uh, speak to, well, in those days, he was already getting Parkinson's, so it was hard for him to speak. But he, you, you could kind of make out what he was saying. And he was always very funny and very humorous. And in the picture on the, on the, on the screen here, this is at CES, where I have just told him the story. I, I reminded him of the story that I just told you. And he grabs me, and he says, 
I was such a bad boy back then. And, uh, you know, we had a good, we had a good laugh uh, out of it. And that, by the way, that is his actual gloves, or a set, one of the set of gloves that he uh, used and, and, and signed for me. So, anyway, that's that story. Those are some pretty big gloves, man. Wow. Um, all right, so, so, Tom, you get to Sega, and like you said, Nintendo 92% market share. Um, and it was a, probably a bit of a hill to climb when you when you first got going. So give us a, a, a sort of what it was like when you first got there, and what it was like as you went through sort of this incredible period of growth. And as you did that as the CEO of the company, how did how did you foster sort of your leadership on down? Because I, I'm sure like like we are having here. Since we're now going through a period of a pretty rapid growth, we have a lot of people coming in, and I have a lot of managers that have now got people in underneath them. What what sort of pearls of wisdom would you have for us? I do think you have a, a bit of an analogous uh, situation here, although I think you're in much better shape than we were at Sega when I went in, to tell you the, to, the truth. Uh, <laughs> No, but but the uh, in terms of a business, you you really have a you uh, <laughs> yeah, I got it. You really you <laughs> you you <laughs> no, but you really uh, you're in in shape now to to really take off, I believe. Uh, and I felt that way at Sega, but I had a a situation where there were. Uh, a, a, a vice president of sales and a following guy under him in sales that really wasn't very good in dealing with the retail environment and kind of given up. Uh, we had some marketing people who had kind of given up. We were fortunate that we had really good product development people in the house. I mean, we had a guy named Ken Balthaser who was terrific and, and who was responsible for bringing a, a Joe Miller into the company. Ed Annunziata was with us. Uh, a, a number of really strong product development people. So as, as I said in the talk, you know, basically, we got rid of the, the naysayers fairly quickly, the guys who didn't think it was possible to succeed against Nintendo. Um, and we, and we, I pushed people for, to do things that hadn't been done in the industry before and to change the industry and brought in, uh, had some great marketing people eventually, uh, a guy named Al Nielsen who was terrific. Uh, Madeline Canapa Schroeder, who was terrific. Her husband Bert Schroeder was a was a, a product develop um, a producer for us. Uh, Ed, didn't he produce Joe Montana? Uh, who was that? Oh yeah, okay. So we had a group of producers who were who were really 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 talented, uh, and then brought in these marketing people, um, uh, Ellen Beth Van Buskirk. Uh, um, Michael and Christine Risley. We brought in a lot of, of females and, and guys who were very, very strong in doing the unusual. And I would say one of the, the leaders of that really was Al, Al Nielsen. And I was also fortunate. I was protected by a guy named Shinobu Toyota, who was the supposed Japanese executive to watch over me and make sure we didn't do anything really dumb. Well, the good news was he agreed with me on most of the things we were doing, and he wouldn't let Japan headquarters know until after we'd done them, <laughs> so so that worked really well to 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 uh, to our advantage as as well. And uh, and I know he he acted as a shield for a lot of stuff that was going on that I was unaware of. So I would say that you know coming in and being having a vision that was different than what the company had been, and getting people to buy into that vision, and getting rid of the people who didn't agree that you could move the company in that direction that was the the key to our early at least our early success so obviously uh we, we've started a mobile division here at the company and ed annunziata is uh the head of gazillion mobile um and used to work at sega obviously for tom so i want you to sit down and just give us a couple of tom stories if you will oh my God. <laughs> echo the dolphin I won't, I won't tell him mr gross. pencil I'm only doing this because you hate these things, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Here. Uh, well, I told you before. One of my favorite stories was um, the base, the interactive baseball yeah. story. Would you? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> well, real quickly, what he's referring to, this was actually not at Sega, it was at Mattel. Early days of electronics, we developed a baseball that had electronics in it so that when a, when a kid was 60 feet away and threw the ball and his dad or his friend caught it, it would tell him how fast he was throwing the ball, right? Well, everybody wants to throw a 90-mile-an-hour fastball, right? And by the way, most kids can't even throw a 70-mile-an-hour fastball. So what happened? All these kids, these little leaguers, are throwing this ball as hard as they can over and over and over, and they threw their arms out. So we had... We probably ruined a generation of what could have been great pitchers because of, of that product. So unintended consequences, you know, doesn't it seem like a good idea to know how fast you can throw a fastball? Well, it seems like a good idea, but it's not so, so good in implementation. It was bad for the kids' arms. What I liked about it was it was so fun that you actually hurt yourself playing it. Like you push yourself to that, to that point. And that's like, I mean, I don't want to hurt anybody, but to give that level of fun I think is a... Is, is a great part of our business. Uh, and then the other story that's in this book that I'll never forget was when we were at Alexis Park, and but, but the, uh, we were at a, uh, uh, a restaurant right near Alexis, Alexis Park. It was, back then it was CES, right? Mm -hmm. And you gave a speech uh, that... Um, Hold that up a little bit more. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not, uh, yeah, and you gave a speech you got to be kidding me. Are you nervous now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that, I don't know if you remember that speech, but it was things weren't looking good for us, really. Like arith the arithmetic wasn't working, but th that was like, and, you know, and I was, what, 29 or something like that. And it was the first time I felt like, holy shit, I'm part of this organization. And I felt the whole, I don't know, the whole room just was ready. And then... That's when Nintendo started. From my point of view, that's when we got behind Nintendo and um, took them out right after that. Yeah. That was a, like a critical moment. One of the uh, crazy things we did at, at Sega, uh, one of the many price drops we had. So we're at the show, and we hear that Nintendo, uh, through, they'd had a, a retailer meeting uh, the night that evening, like at 5 o'clock, and we hear they're lowering the price of Super NES. And uh, what are we going to do? They're going to lower it to $100. And so I got on the phone with my team and called back to Japan because they really, Japan was responsible for hardware. We were more responsible for software and marketing. And I said, we got to lower the price to $100. And this was a big fight, big fight over the phone. And it went on till like 10 o'clock at night. And finally, Nakayama and the board agreed we could lower the price to $100. But I didn't want it to appear that we were copying Nintendo. So the marketing team and, and some of the producers who were at the show, we worked all night. We found a printing company uh, that was part of, I think it was either, a, it wasn't the hotel we were in, but it was a hotel nearby where we could, we printed newspapers, fake newspapers that said, Sega lowering price to $100. And we had those fake newspapers put under every buyer's door in, uh, in Las Vegas. We had our press releases done. We released the press releases and press kits at 6 in the morning before Nintendo could make their announcement to the public. So it appeared that Nintendo was, in fact, once again, copying Sega. Awesome. Anybody else want to come up? <laughs> so... <clears throat> in uh, wait, you can't leave. Uh, come here, come here, come here, come here. Okay, so one of the one of the big hits that you had at Sega was Echo the Dolphin, which was Ed's uh, one of Ed's babies. Um, so can you just walk me through that? What your initial thoughts were when you first heard the pitch, and sort of how that all came to be? Well, I don't know if I specifically remember that day, but I I certainly remember as we were working on uh, you were working on Echo that it was mind-blowingly unusual visuals and smooth action that we hadn't seen before in a 16-bit game. And so, you know, I, I was just knocked out by how beautiful... I consider it a work of art. I mean, I think Echo the Dolphin is a, is a real uh, work of art. Uh, and it became a, one of the better sellers of the, of the company, and, and you did it. So what were you thinking? 
Okay, and there's more where that came from, right? Yeah. That are being done right here. Yeah, yeah, right here, right now. Yeah, one of the futures of the company. Yeah, the Bam. Too. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Okay, thanks. Okay, Ed Nunziata, Gazillion Mobile. Yes, yes, yes. We do have a lot of talent here. Um, where's the great Mike May? Where is he? Where is he? Yeah, not that the future's in your hands, Mike, but uh, we're excited. We're excited with what you've going on. This is our stealth project. We're not, we're not saying we're not saying anything about this yet. All right, uh, I want to open it up for uh, for anybody that has uh, a question for Tom. All right. Hi, I'm Matt. Tom. Um, um, I, I was kind of curious about how when you uh, looked at the demographic for teens and college kids. Um, I'm sure you researched it, but I'm kind of curious how you got to that decision um, to inform, you know, you to pitch Tangent Graphics because you, you did, sure. you know, sports and stuff. <laughs> it, it was, it, in my opinion, it was really a no-brainer. Nintendo had the, the younger market locked up. They had that 5- to 12-year-old market sealed. So, to me, it was just obvious Let's go. So those kids are going to start getting older. They're going to get tired of the kinds of products that Nintendo was bringing out. Let's go after the teens and older age with sports titles, with, uh, in those days, Joe Montana football, John Madden football, uh, FIFA soccer, NBA basketball, MLB baseball, um, and NHL hockey. And let's do the sports titles because that certainly will appear, appeal to an older age demographic. And let's do more action uh, oriented games and yes let's let's go after the more violent uh, games as well more strategy more RPG and also more violent action uh, games and uh, as I think you all all know we were the ones who did Mortal Kombat with a claim with uh, the original look from the arcade in it in other words red blood instead of green blood which Nintendo had and the green blood and versus the red blood really was a, a great talking point on uh, among teenagers, everybody wanted to play with the red blood and not the green blood. How would you improve Sonic's current image? And after that, um, how do you improve Trump's image? <laughs> um, like many folks, I've been kind of disappointed in some of the games that have come out and are Sonic the Hedgehog games lately. They, they haven't been good enough. But I, I have faith that uh, they can produce uh, better Sonic games in the future. And, uh, and, and, and that's what it comes down to. I mean, the, the gameplay and some of the things that they, they did over the ensuing years weren't, weren't as good as the things that the original team did. And you know how difficult that is. The original team is usually always going to be better than the guys who have to do the, the follow-ups. Although I will say, Sonic 2 was what I consider the best one we ever did, and that really was not the original team completely. It was the original team plus a bunch of uh, U.S. guys, and we housed them down uh, down in uh, in Palo Alto. And they, they worked very hard getting that game out and then the subsequent games while I was there. But uh, that team is gone, and it's new people working on Sonic the Hedgehog, and I'm confident that they'll get it right you know, I think they just have to have more time to to get the gameplay right. Uh, and, and I don't think they've been able to do as, you know, we had an advantage. It was, we were the first and it was easier to do different marketing than it would be today. And we had, you know, it was simple to do marketing back then. You just ran commercials on television. Now you got to be on all these different social sites and, and you have to get the bloggers on in your favor and you've got to get, get YouTube videos going and a lot of different ways of reaching the audience today that, uh, that, that we didn't have to worry about. So I think they have a little bit of a tougher problem today, but it all comes back to great gameplay. If it's great gameplay, uh, Sonic can once again become a, a huge hit. By the way, you know, Sonic movie is under, under development right now, so we'll see how, how that does. Anybody else? Andrew? Yes. What do you think of uh, VR and kind of where VR is going? I got to tell a VR story. So when I was at Sega, some of you know, we developed a VR headset. And uh, 
we were working with, in my opinion, one of the founders of early VR, Jaron Lanier. Any of you know who Jaron Lanier is? He was very early in, in VR development. He was a huge guy, um, big blonde dreadlocks, probably, I don't say how much he weighed, but it was a lot. And uh, he was also a great musician. He played many different instruments. So we had a meeting set up with Jaron at his home. I think his home was somewhere in San Mateo. And so uh, product development team, marketing guys, me with our VR headset, we trudge over to Jaron's house. And uh, we hear a piccolo playing or a flute or something playing. And we're knocking on the door and nobody's answering. But we hear this flute music. And we're knocking, ringing the doorbell. Nobody answers. Finally, the door is thrown open. And there is a naked Jaron Lanier with a flute in his hand, having forgotten, saying, what? Had forgotten completely about the meeting that we had set up. So anyway, the early, early VR that we developed, um, and it, I think Ed remembers this, you'd put the headset on, and after about 15 minutes, you would really get sick. You would either get sick to your stomach and throw up, or you would get completely disoriented and, and not be able to you know, you just lost your balance. It was, it was really tough. So that's why we didn't do VR back in those days. I've experienced uh, Oculus and I've experienced, uh, you know, the, the, what, what Sony and, uh, and the other guys are doing. And I think it's really impressive today. I'm really impressed by uh, how immersive it is and how you really talk about suspending disbelief. I mean, you really believe you are in the situation that they've put you into. So I, I, I think VR is going to be terrific for the future. What I'm not sure about is have they completely overcome the issue that I just talked about? How long can you do it and not get sick or disoriented? And I didn't do it long enough to know whether they've solved those problems or, or not yet. But I think if they have, man, this is a great a great new experience, a great new way of engaging uh, video game players and playing uh, a more immersive game than you've ever played before. If it really works, I think it's going to be terrific for education. So I'm, I'm really a, a proponent of VR right now, probably because I'm an expert who doesn't know much, right? But, I mean, there's a lot of things I've seen in VR. I, you, I don't know if you've heard of Wolfbert. Wolf, Wolfbert, terrible name. Anyway, this is a gal who's done VR of great art museums around the world. So she goes into the museum and she films in the museum of all these masterpieces. So you can, you can literally go online with, uh, yeah, you gotta get it online, and, and download uh, a tour of the Rees Museum in Amsterdam and see all of the great works of art there. And some of them, you go real close in on the work of art and she's created actors and actresses depicting the scene that's portrayed in the picture. So you think you're interacting now with this, the actors from 1520 in this work of art. So a lot of cool things like that are, are, are uh, at least I think they're cool, and they're coming along nicely, I hope. Hey, Tom. Uh, you've clearly made a lot of risky decisions, and it seems that most of them have paid off for you. Can you talk about maybe a couple that didn't, didn't pay off? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think everybody thinks that, uh, that Sega CD wasn't a great uh, product. But I, I actually take a different tact with that. I think we had to do Sega CD because none of us knew how to program on optical discs. None of us knew how to, s to deal with the uh, lag times that we had back in those days and other issues that were created by uh, that new medium. So. That's one where I'm not sorry. I'm glad we did it. I think we had to do it, even though it, we didn't sell that many of them. It was a, it was a necessary uh, evil. I think uh, 32X was probably a mistake, uh, those of you who, who, who had it. We, we did it because we, we, we were trying to keep 16-bit alive, and we, we wanted it to survive longer, and we didn't want to have to introduce the Saturn as soon as we, we did. And the problem was there was supposed to be, I th I, I'll, I'll probably get this wrong, but I think there were supposed to be six 32X games divided out, out of Japan, and we were supposed to do six here at Sega of America. And uh, we probably got four done, and they got none done. And so we didn't have enough good software to support the hardware. I think probably the best uh, experience we had was Doom on 32X, but everything else wasn't as good as that. So that's, that's one that we, that we probably should not have, have done. Uh, 
a lot of people think Night Trap was a disaster. I kind of disagree because it, we thought Night Trap was really campy and kind of a funny horror movie, a, a B or C grade horror movie, you know, that was people would recognize as being campy because the players were actually rescuing the girls. They weren't trying to kill the girls. They were rescuing the girls. But that's not how the media viewed it, and it really came down pretty hard on, on Sega for that. Now, it, we did have a rating on it, but there were some initial uh, products that went out that didn't have the rating stamped on the box. And so I would consider that a big mistake because uh, that, that just shouldn't have happened. What else? I don't know. I'm sure there are many others. Uh, I'm really curious about the Saturn. Uh, you, I, I know you actually ended up complaining to Sega about uh, Sega of Japan about the architecture. And I'm just curious what made you who you were listening to or was it you directly that knew why the architecture was bad I just it seems like a weird transaction or something difficult to communicate so I'm not technical at all so I was listening to uh, my good friend Joe Miller who's since passed away uh, who ran R&D for us it was a terrific individual and I also was listening to what what the alternatives could have been and one of the alternatives was a chipset from uh, Silicon Graphics, that Jim Clark, who was then the chairman CEO of Silicon Graphics, called me up and said, hey, you got to come look at this chipset that this guy, Jensen Huang, is that the, how you pronounce the guy who runs NVIDIA today? Anyway, Jensen Huang, I think is his name. He was working for Silicon Graphics then, he's a great inventor. Uh, so Joe and I went over with the team and looked at this chipset from Silicon Graphics and what it could do, and we thought it was better than Saturn, what we had seen from for Saturn, and we thought it was better both in in terms of speed and in terms of graphics and in terms of sound and also this new thing, the internet. It had greater capabilities of of uh, connecting to the internet than we knew the Saturn was going to have. So that was who I who I listened to. I certainly I certainly wouldn't have made those uh, negative comments or or had that feeling my, on my own, because I just don't know enough about it myself, but I did rely on guys who I knew were really good technically. And after, uh, so we brought the Japan hardware team over to see the Silicon Graphics chipset, and uh, they said, ah, it's too big a chip. In the manufacturing process, there'll be too much waste and too much throw off, so we really can't use it, so too bad. And Jim Clark called me up and he said, well, well what do I do now? And I said, well, there's this other company up in Seattle you might want to talk to. And that became the uh, N64 chip. Awesome. All right, so once again, I'm, I'm giving you the plug. I don't get any money for it. <laughs> okay, fine. Fine. So the, 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 book is, the book is called Console Wars. And, uh, again, we're so lucky to have Tom Kalinske in the office this morning, Tom became our chairman about uh, six weeks ago or so. Um, one thing that I haven't mentioned about this is that uh, the movie has been optioned by Seth Rogen. Um, can you give us an update as to whether or not this is going to make it onto the and uh, onto the screen? And, and more moreover, and more importantly, because you're pretty pretty good looking dude, um, who's going to play you in the movie? <laughs> so, uh, Seth. Rogan and Evan Goldberg have the screen rights f for the book and are working on the on the, the screenplay. They've got to take this 600-page book down to about 220 pages for a screenplay. Uh, Scott Rudin has agreed to produce it. Scott Rudin did Moneyball, Social Network, uh, Captain Phillips. He's, he, I think he got two Tonys last week, and he also does Broadway productions. Um, the doc, Sony's plan, it's on the Sony schedule for 2017, but I wouldn't bet on it because they haven't finished the screenplay yet and they should be shooting by now. So I think it's behind schedule. Um, the idea that Sony has, and I, I thought this was this kind of unusual, they want to have both the feature film with actors and actresses and probably turning it into a little bit of a comedy. Uh, uh, they want to release that at about the same time they do the documentary. As a as part of their marketing, I'm not I don't understand that, but that's what they are planning to do. So because the documentary is basically shot, the only thing they need to do to that is edit some music into it, and then it would be ready to go. 
who's going to play me? If I said who I wanted to play me, it won't happen. That's for sure. I'm, I'm sure that they'd change it. But my daughters, you know, I have, I have three daughters and three sons. My three daughters think it should be Bradley Cooper because you saw He-Man, who was obviously molded after me. We have the same abs as Bradley Cooper. Okay, Tom. <laughs> no, when I saw the He-Man up there, I was like, wait, how did Andrew Hare get up on the, uh, on the, on the screen? <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, one last question b before you go, uh, and that is, um, obviously, there's many things you could be doing right now. Um, what was it about Gazillion? Like, what attracted you? Like, why are you here? What, what, what do you see in us? How did we get so lucky to have you as our chairman? Well, clearly, it's because of you. <laughs> uh uh, as, as I've said, I mean, I'm, I've been spending most of my time using uh, technology or helping people use technology to improve education. But I love video games. Uh, I still play occasionally. Believe it, you should, I, you should come to my basement and see what I have set up. I have, oh, we should do that sometime. I have, I have every, every Genesis game I think ever made on my shelves in my basement, and I still have a Genesis hooked up along with a Sega CD and a Saturn. And so I still play on those. And then I have the, my sons have the new system set up upstairs. So we have a lot of video game activity going on in the, in the house. Uh, and when you explained to me what was going on over here, it sure sounded a lot to me like early, early Sega. And I thought, boy, that's a that's a great opportunity to be involved with a group to to do to do build help build a, a company. And so I'm just here to to give good advice and and help help you and the team. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll be very 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 successful. And I think we can because it it truly is a great game. Uh, you know, it's it takes a long time to download, but once you get that done, it's a great game. <laughs> Yeah, and that, uh, um, and that and that's that. The thank you so much uh, again for being here. That's that. Um, that's really super. So, um, I'm, I guess it's probably at the point now to wrap this up. But uh, for those of you that are joining us outside of the company, this is our literally inaugural uh, gazillion fireside chat. We're a video game uh, developer and publisher out in Silicon Valley. Uh, you can look us up on our website. Um, we have lots of product announcements forthcoming this summer, um, entering into a period where this company is going to be growing. Um, and uh, it's an exciting time for us. Um, as part of uh, some of the things that I wanted to do for my employees, uh, I've been fortunate enough to be able to work in the industry with people like Tom and to be able to have them to come in and share their stories and share their experiences uh, with my team. Um, so that's what this is all about. We'll be doing another one in the next month or so. We'll be announcing uh, who that is uh, very shortly. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody for joining us this morning. And um, Tom, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Um, I think you're going to be able to provide a lot of mentorship here. Uh, to some very talented guys that are in, and, and gals that are working themselves up through Gazillion. So anyway, thank you very much, and uh, that's a wrap.